topic one, nature and behavior of costs. So how it works is that topic one is mostly looking at what is, how do our costs behave and what, what is the definition of the cost? How do they behave and what, what are their trades, right? So you look at things as cost object, classification, we classify those costs and how do they actually behave? Because yes, at the end you did incur a cost but then we will ask you what type of cost is it and how is it different from the others and how do you treat it, right? So then thereafter, uh, we're looking at, we'll be looking at, you would be able to, def to, to estimate your cost. So once you understand your cost, it will be easier for you to determine how will it look like in the future. So that's where the whole estimation techniques come into play. And then after being able to estimate your cost, we will be looking at cost volume profit analysis, which is very interesting, but um, certain topics, I mean, certain principles of break-even analysis, but we will get into that. So if you look at topic one, it's more of defining what your cost is, how to classify it, and how does it behave? After understanding the true nature of your cost, you are able to estimate your cost. But there are certain techniques that you use to estimate that cost. Then there, after being able to forecast that, you can analyze this cost in terms of um, your actuals, your estimation. How does it all fall into you making a profit at the end of the day? Okay, so that's a grasp of topic one and what you will be able to achieve at the end of topic one. All right, so cost definition, this is in your module. Most of the stuff that I take up from your module, so don't be surprised, but yeah, I just highlight things that are important for, for this class because you can't cover the whole module. Cost definition and classification. So in terms of our costs, right? Costs are assigned to a cost object. So a cost object, we will get to it as to what it is. But when you assign those costs, you need to know which one is a direct cost, which one is an indirect cost, all right? And that's the first basis of your cost definition. Is it direct or is it indirect? Then thereafter, after defining whether it's direct or indirect, you start to classify that cost according to its nature, according to its behavior, and sometimes time frame. And also you classified whether it's a product or period cost. So this, I like this slide because it's an overview of what are we dealing with? Is it a direct or indirect cost? Nature wise, is it under manufacturing or non-manufacturing? If it is manufacturing, is it a direct material? Is it a direct labor? Is it manufacturing overheads, right? And if we're looking at behavior, we say, is it fixed, is it variable, or is it in between where it's semi-variable or is it semi-fixed? So these definitions, as I've mentioned, you might say, oh, I've looked at this, but it, it catches on in other topics. By the time we get to other topics, you should not be having a debate on whether this is fixed or is it semi-fixed or is it semi-variable. Or is this a product cost or what? You should embed these definitions in your head at this point in time. So if I can just ask you guys, what do you understand by a cost object? Or can you give me an example of a cost object? Anyone, what do you guys understand as a cost object? Or what comes into your mind when you think of a cost object? Yes, Martin? Or Robin? Sorry, Martin is probably your name. Yeah. Yeah, good morning. Um, good morning. So, yeah, so what comes to mind is that it is a product that is manufactured and we have to work out the cost um, for that product. Um, I think anything um, that's been manufactured, an example, a table maybe? A table maybe, I like that. So we will run with the table okay. um, example. Thank you for your contribution. 
All right, so thanks, Robin, for your contribution. You are right to say that it is an object, something that's being manufactured, a product that's being manufactured, and you made a table as an example. Cool. So, as Robin has explained, some of the things that go into manufacturing, let's think about a table. I like that example. So, when it comes to, yes, cool, I was on the slide. So when it comes to you, you asking yourself, can I be able to trace costs to this table, right? That I'm that I'm, I'm manufacturing. Can I allocate cost to whatever that I'm manufacturing? So in this instance, it will be a table. So that's the what cost is this for, right? And once you've identified the product you will be able to see, okay, fine, what cost, let, let me maybe put the question to you guys. What type of cost would you allocate to making a table, for instance? I'll take the table as an example. What are some of the costs that you see when you see a table? What cost do you see, if I may ask you, that are traceable to the making of a table? What comes to your mind? Wood, wood comes to my mind. Nails. Nails, okay. Others? Wood, maybe. Yeah. Labor. Wood. Yes. Glue. Glue. Yeah, glue, okay. Um, I think my, the machinery to cut the wood. Yes, yes, yes. Wages on employees. Wages on employees. There's another one. A varnish. Varnish. And uh, maybe to give you guys a hint, where was all of this done? In effect, building. And, and that machine that you were using, what is it using um, for it to end up working on this table? Electricity. Electricity. Yes. So do you guys see that a factory, it's a rental cost, right? There's electricity, there's wages, there's people who are in finance, who are taking care of looking at the whole operation to see how the costs are behaving, the profit and loss from making this table. There's also marketing costs, right? They are not directly traceable to it, but you have to think, how am I going to sell this thing? There's that cost again, right? So what I'm trying to explain is that a cost object is the beginning of you being able to trace cost, to try see beyond um, what you have produced. Now, after seeing all those costs that we've mentioned, you start going back to this table to say, all right, so let's start assigning these costs that we just all mentioned. Which ones are direct? Which ones are indirect? Then you start looking at the direct and indirect. Which one, are, its origin has to do with manufacturing and which ones are non-manufacturing? Right? And how do they actually behave? For instance, rental is fixed because that means that every single month I'm paying rental to, to use this factory or a mortgage, whatever it is, but there's a fixed amount that I'm paying for the space for using these tables. I mean, for producing or manufacturing these tables. And others, the other costs, they come according to the number. They are directly proportional to the number of, um, what's this thing? Number of tables that you manufacture. So the nail, for instance, I would say that it's a variable cost because the nails, you don't just buy in bulk, you buy according to the number of tables that you want to manufacture, right? So as I've explained, you will identify total operating costs and then that's when you will start looking at the, I mean, on the behavior. If it's manufacturing, I've mentioned them here, you know, it's working. I think I'm no longer going to go back to you guys, but please answer and I'll ask you questions. Um, yeah, so manufacturing, what are those? Non-manufacturing, I've mentioned marketing costs. 
you know, um, marketing cost very NB to always remember that is the selling and distributing whatever product that you are making. Because it doesn't make sense for you to say I'm manufacturing tables or I'm manufacturing phones without you having a plan for selling and distributing those phones to the market. Right? So for those, there's always cost. Um, administrative costs are the ones that I've mentioned. There's someone who's answering um, calls to say, uh, what's this thing? There's someone who's asking, taking orders, someone who's in procurement to make sure that you get the wood that you've ordered, you know. These departmental costs, you will see them as we go into allocating overheads. But it's very important for you to be able to visualize the whole process of making a table. I hope I'm making sense because um, that will help you. Um, that will help you to, to trace those costs, to understand what drives your costs. Okay? Controlling the organization, there's CEOs, there's COOs, there's CFOs, there's finance, there's HR, there's... What I'm trying to explain is that from that small table that we are making or from the iPhone that you have or Samsung, whatever, I'm not advertising any brands, from whatever that you produce, there's a whole lot going on behind, behind this product. I hope I'm making sense. When you try to understand this product, you'll be able to see the total operating cost to make this product. You'll be able to now be inquisitive to say the behavior of this cost. Is it manufacturing or non-manufacturing? Under manufacturing, what do I expect? Under non-manufacturing, what do I expect? How does it behave? Is it fixed or is it variable? Because then it will catch on to say when you are doing your income statement, how is it presented? Because it depends on the audience that you will be doing your reports for, right? So I'm just saying that, as I've explained, a small topic as topic one builds up to other topics that we're going to touch on. And you do not want to be in a situation where you are doing topic seven question and you are still stuck on which one is direct, which one is indirect, which one is non-manufacturing. Do not cram. Try to understand the basis of your classification or of your cost. All right. And then now, cost classification, manufacturing cost, we are now breaking them down. Direct material, it's all materials that can be classified as forming part of the individual or finished product. So direct material, you will see the word, you will see, you will see it, right? Uh, you might not necessarily see the vanish, but you will see that the vanish part, right? But I'm just saying that you can identify it as part of the finished product. Vanish, you can see. There's no way that you can't see vanish on the wood. But then all I'm saying is that see direct material as things that you can see as part of the finished product. Direct labor, it's work that's needed to take that wood into a finished product. Because there is no, there's really no use of just taking wood and then put some nails, put some whatever that you're going to do, and then say that it's a table. There's the method in which there's different types of tables, right? There's, there's different shapes. There's different designs of table. Someone has to know how to do that. So normally, work needs to be done to convert that wood into a finished product, right? I hope I'm making sense. And then... Um, there's indirect material, indirect labor, other, this you will get from your um, textbook. And conversion cost, there's another term that you will see as we go. Conversion cost, it is manufacturing overheads and direct labor. It's the, then it creates a conversion cost. Because if you try to understand it, 
whatever that you had to do to convert this direct material into a finished product, that's conversion cost. So I would say manufacturing over whatever machinery that, because for you to convert this wood into a stylish table, you will need a certain machine that is used by a certain person who knows or who is skilled to use that machine to convert this wood into this fabulous table that you have in your as your dinner set piece or whatever. I'm making an example and I hope it makes sense. So conversion cost, it's manufacturing overheads and direct labor. It's good to visualize this thing so that you don't cram and you'll be able to think of it when it comes to process costing, because there's conversion costs and percentages and 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 then prime cost. It's your direct labor and your direct material. These two form part of your prime costs. Very important to know. Then cost behavior. I might be repeating myself, but I'll just go through the pages. Cost behavior, I've explained it in high level, but this explains a variable cost behavior. It goes along with the activity level, meaning how many units of tables are you producing that will go with the cost of making those tables, right? So the cost increases as the activity increases. That's variable. And then variable cost behavior I've mentioned, it stays constant, it remains constant, it's independent from your activity levels. So even if you produce, let's say, 10,000 tables in that month. Next month, it's 5,000 because it all depends on the demand. Your rental stays the same. So let's maybe look at if you have a shop at a mall and you are renting space, all right? That rental stays the same. Whether you find that people, maybe for this season, they don't come and buy your table or you find that a hey, what's this thing you see how the economy is going have you guys realized how many shops are actually uh, there's there's so many house i mean spaces to let in malls because certain companies unfortunately after the whole um it was either the riots after COVID, they closed because guess what there was no activity going. However, their rental stayed the same. Do you guys see what I mean? That you find certain shops would be excited to say, oh, wow, that's nice. They have this shop here at the mall. But if there's no activity, you wouldn't be able to cover up this rental. And if you can't, you end up seeing certain shops being closed. Um, that's why now, as you guys probably have seen in retailers, especially clothing retail, you find your Edgars and whatever, they will have an Edgars, which is a big name, right? Edgars um, rents a space in a mall, but within Edgars, you would find a certain section within the shop. It will be for Mango or, um, I don't know, other brands. But certain brands, do you guys understand what I'm saying? Brands are no longer going the whole, let me let a certain space and say this is a Gucci or um, Mango shop. No, we will rather have an agreement with Edgar's, for instance, to say, can we use a certain section within your leased space um, to sell our clothing? Have you, have you guys seen that? Um, I'm just asking in general so that you understand how broad this fixed cost certain companies will end up adjusting it so that it's lesser as opposed to having a 10,000 these going through every single month, people opting for sharing space. Others are banks, because I, I work in the banking industry. 
So what we do is that right now we're reducing the space in the branches. Either branches are closed or we're reducing the space of the branch because that's also a lot of cost. Hey? That's why sometimes when you are getting inside the branch, we charge you more for just asking for a statement because we're saying you can go use the ATM for a statement or you can use your internet banking to download your statement is cheaper than going inside the branch. Because if you go inside the branch, we charge you more because we have to we have to take into account this fixed cost as part of the service that we are giving you. I hope I'm not confusing. Are there any questions or comments from what I've just mentioned? Uh, no, it's clear. Thank you for the practical examples as well. Okay, cool. Thank you. We are on. All right. Cool. All right, cool. Thanks. So that's that. So what I'm trying to do, the practical example, do the same with yourself so that when you get a question, do not get a situation where you don't know whether it's fixed or what. So let's get to uh, fixed or variable. So let's get to cost behavior. Another section of cost behavior is semi-variable or semi-fixed. So uh, semi-variable cost includes a fixed amount within a relevant range of output and the other amount starts varying with the output changes. So let's look at this. So it's saying, so we all know total activity. So there's a certain portion where there is a cost that stays the same, right? No matter how much you use it, but it's within a relevant range. So maybe they'll say from a zero to a hundred, this will stay the same. But the moment you, you exceed that hundred, it starts changing. What practical example can you guys come with of an example of a semi-variable cost? Um, I think a phone contract. A phone contract is a perfect one. You find that they'll tell you that, thank you for your suggestion. So they'll tell you that, all right, so you are paying 200 per month. You will get one gig uh, data bundles and also uh, 100 rand a time. However, should you exceed this one gig, you will start need to you will start uh, you'll start being charged based on the amount of consumption of data that you use after that one gig. If you exceed the 100 airtime, when you're making calls or SMSs or whatever, we'll start you charging that. So your billing will come to say this is the agreed amount, the fixed amount for your phone um 200 and then they'll say you'll see data usage um whatever three gig then they charge you for it um calls they only have a statement of calls that you made and then they'll give you a price then you will be surprised to see a billing of 1000 and you're shocked but it's because you got into a semi-variable type of contract when it comes to the cost that you're paying your uh, service provider, I mean, whether it's a Vodacom, ETM, or Telcom, or Celsi, but I'm just giving you an example. So that's a perfect one of a semi uh, variable cost. Um, some people, they'll just say, and, and you must be careful of the advertising that the service provider will say. They'll say from 200 per month. You'll, you'll just see the 200 per month, which is big. And then they give you the benefits, but they did say that it's from, right? So that means that there's a portion that stays the same. That's the from. But then they know there's going to be certain changes. It will be the clauses that you need to read. And then as it goes up, you will see that the bill doesn't, doesn't come to 200, but it's actually more. If not, you stay within what they told you, which is the relevant range. So that's the same effect. I mean, semi-variable, semi-fixed. This one jumps, right? Cost remains the same level. It's still independent to the activity until the capacity needs to be expanded or contracted. So sometimes you find that leases, they jump. Besides lease, lease, I think it's, it's not a good one, but I was saying that, let's say the contracted part, 
your lease is for a year, you are paying 10,000. Next month, I mean, next year, on an annual base, now we put an increase to that lease portion, then it jumps again. So that's a contracted example. Expansion or capacity, the more you increase, because your lease will say um, 100 square meter, I'm making a silly example, 100 square meter, you lease it for 10,000. But the moment you want to increase the space, we will need to charge you more, right? So that's where it jumps. Um, I think it's fine. I'm just looking at the time. All right. All right. So any questions before we move to the estimation techniques? But I think summary of it all, I still say, firstly, identify that cost object. What are we producing? Once you've identified, try see all the costs that you can put onto this product that you're producing. Then thereafter, you look at the nature of this. You look at the behavior, you start classifying it, then it will help you better understand what type of cost that you're working with. And then thereafter, you would be able to work on your question that they will be asking you, but at least the basis of understanding your cost will be covered. All right, estimation techniques and linear equation. Um, all right, so these are the methods that we use. So remember what we just covered now, being the semi-variable or mixed cost, right? One needs to know how to separate these costs, because as I've mentioned, it's very important for you to classify and identify your cost, it's whether it's variable or fixed, because there's a different type of decision making that goes with understanding your cost. It influences your pricing, it influences which product you still make or not make. You know, as I've even mentioned that certain retailers are even bringing it to a point where they're sharing space with other retailers, there's people who are reducing their size of their, as I've said, branches. So, and it all comes from understanding your cost that informs this type of decisions. So, if you get a situation where you have a semi fixed, I mean, semi variable cost, you as a management accountant, you need to understand how to split it because it has repercussions. So some of these methods to be able to split the semi-variable into fix the variable are these. There's linear equation, there's the high-low, the scatter diagram, and simple regression analysis. Okay, linear equation, I think I just focused on two. The others, you guys will read on them. The linear equation one, it's an estimation technique or model that can be used to see the level of operation when it comes to the linear equation. So linear equation, as you know, y, y represents in this instance, total cost. A, it's your fixed cost on the intersection of the y-axis. B, it's your variable cost per unit of the activity, depending on the slope of the straight line a graph. X, it's the activity level. That is the volume that you produce, your machine hours, your inspection hours. So these are your activities. So linear equation is what you use to solve for whether identifying your variables. Sometimes they tell you you're fixed. You identify this or you are solving. For whatever that you're solving, you'll be able to see it from this. It's not a thing of they'll give you a question and you don't know what you're solving for. Sometimes you're solving for the total cost. Sometimes it's for the fixed. Sometimes it's for the variable. Sometimes it's the unit. Okay. High-low method. With high-low method, so high-low method, what we are trying to get is this B. It's the variable cost, it's this B, right? So variable cost per unit. How do we do it? 
So you will see from your question, without them even telling you about the high-low method, you will see activity. They'll give you a table of saying that these are the costs for this activity. So you'll see the cost going from 20 to 100. And then you will see the activity that goes, which is the volumes, where they'll say 10 uh, units to 50 units. So as I've just mentioned, you see the lowest cost, you see the lowest unit, and you see the highest cost and the highest um, unit, right? Then there, what you do, you come to a high-low method to say, what is the difference between that 100 cost that I saw minus the 20 cost? Then what is the difference between that, um, I even forgot what I said for the units, but I'll say the 50 minus the 10. What answer that you get, because this is cost over unit, so that means that you will get um you will get a variable cost per unit then now you got the b right we'll do an example because i'm sure that this just doesn't explain it better but i hope you guys are following then you got the b and you have the y the total cost you now need to fix you need to get the a which is the total fixed cost. So for you to get that, they'll say the fixed costs are then determined as follows. There's your A, you've got the total cost. So they say total mixed cost for a related activity, meaning you choose either the highest or the lowest. You can't say both. So meaning you're taking your 100 or whatever, you minus the variable cost that you just got here and the related activity. So let's go to activity 2.1, page 21, page 21 of your module to look at example. I said it's activity what? 2.1. Okay, activity two. I hope you guys can still see my screen. So activity 2.1, a doublet limited incurred cost indicated below during the six months um 30 june these costs change but not in relation to the volume so it's almost like as they changed from the, it seems like they were constant and then they changed okay so remember that graph this graph this graph so they were the same then they changed you see, you just take it from what they just said here, yeah? then you'll be able to say, okay, they're speaking about a mixed cost, the semi-variable cost. And then the months, it's Jan till June. Number of units, there you see them, there's 98, 100, 105, 95, 10. So from these volumes, the lowest, it's 95, and the highest, it's 106. Then historical cost related to the number of units that were produced is that. So you can see the lowest is this one and the highest is this one. So as I've mentioned, from you need to be able to read questions. This is a technique. Read questions before you go to the question. It helps a lot because by the time you get to the question, you're not shocked. So I always tell you that when you have a question, and it's an example, or it's a question paper, whatever that they are saying in that question, UNISA did not waste link, uh, ink, right? So from what I'm trying to explain is that without even going to the question, which is a high-low question, but Fine, it's a limited company. That means, and they've been cut cost, fine. Sometimes this limited um, thing comes into play later on, but okay, fine. It's a limited company, and they're telling you that six months, 
these costs change and not in relation to the volume. This is not a waste of ink. I've told you that from this sentence, you're already thinking about that graph, the semi variable graph that shows that that means that these costs were once constant and then they changed. So that means that it's a semi variable. Then you go ahead, then you see a table that shows activity. They did not waste ink again to just show you numbers. From this, you should be able to say this is an indication that which tool can I use to split and see what's fixed, what's variable. Then you can see from the table that, oh, high, low, they did say that I'm working with different activity, the highest and the lowest, and different costs that, in, that relates to that activity, and it's high and low. Then you start already highlighting this. By the time you get to your required, trust me, you saved two minutes because you are now just going to work with what you've highlighted. You know what you need to do. I'm just giving you as a thing of when you're reading question, reading is a skill. You already know what you need to do. All you're waiting for is the required. You don't have to just read, go to the required, go back to reading. Sometimes it, it just adds more time when you're writing exams. So try reduce your writing time by reading carefully. Try to get hints so that by the time you get to the required, you know what you need to do and you do it quickly. So the question says, use the high-low method. You wouldn't be surprised because you've already preempted that to determine the variable cost and the total cost. Cool. So we look at A. Right? So for you to solve for that, you do this is what I was explaining there. So I think this will be easier because we are dealing with numbers. So high low says variable cost, solve for B. Variable cost have the highest cost and the lowest cost relative to the units down. Then you get 10 rand per unit. Then you say total fixed cost. And I've mentioned with the total fixed cost, commit to the observation being it's either the highest or lowest. So if you're choosing the highest, cool. That means that I'm using the total cost being this two point thingy. Then you multiply your 10 rand by the number of units at that level. And then that means that your fixed cost it's a thousand. Some can choose the lowest observation. Then a question would come to see, please formulate a linear equation and that explains and predicts the cost behavior. Here you are just showing that you understand that linear equation. Total cost is equals to the fixed cost plus this is the B variable and X is the unit. Then sometimes they'll ask you to forecast um, the total cost if they change the number of units that's being manufactured. So you will take your fixed cost because it stays the same even though your units have changed, right? So you will then say uh, 1,000 plus 10 rand times this, then that means that your cost will change to 2.1 as opposed to that. I just need to confirm with the question B. Like, uh, yeah. or where, where we need, where, like question B. Because mm -hmm. it says Y equals to 1000 plus 10X. If I can say 1000 plus 10 plus uh, 106 or 95, will I be wrong? Or maybe yes. I didn't understand the Yes. Um, all right. So good question. Uh, I think I'm not presenting. Let me present. Cool. So a linear equation, as you remember, a linear equation, here it is. The formula is saying y is equals to a plus 
B and X. What is your Y's, the total cost? A, it's your fixed cost. And B, it's your variable. X is any activity level. So in this instance, you have determined what is your fixed which is the 1,000, we are all on the same page there. And what is your variable? You've already identified that is 10 rand per unit. So you would need to say that the total cost is dependent on my fixed cost plus variable, but the activity level, it can vary. So that's why you need to put it as an X. So you wouldn't, you wouldn't be correct to put 106 because 106 is this X. It's the units, which are variable to change. That's why from this linear equation, you can use it to forecast if there's a change in units. Your total cost will change. I hope I'm making sense, Kola. Yeah, I understand now. Okay, cool. 106 is the units. So a linear equation, we use it for forecasting and also determining what is my fixed? What is my variable? Um, and then, they, I mean, variable per unit. Then thereafter, you can use it to forecast your total cost because your total cost is dependent on what ends up happening here. Yes, you have your fixed, you have your variable unit, but then this might change. Okay. Um, all right, so I'm hoping... Mm, we are all on the same page. So that was high low. Okay, so I've got CVP, and then we will do topic two. All right, I hope you guys are still with me. Let me know if you need a stretch moment, but let me try push CVP so that we know that topic one is done. So cost, volume, profit. Um, cost, volume, profit. It's it has certain assumptions that we will look at. There's contribution, there's terms called contribution, there's break even analysis, and there's target profit analysis. Remember, I've explained, I'm trying to tie everything that we've learned. We would have defined and understood our cost. Great. Then thereafter, there's certain parts where our cost can be classified as a semi fixed, I mean, semi variable then you know which tools to use to strip out your variable and your fix. Then we learned about linear equation to say that I can forecast my cost now once I've understood how they behave. Great. Then after having this uh, wisdom or knowledge of how costs are used, you can now start analyzing how your cost and your volume impact your profit. You can now start making decisions. You can start analyzing where, like I said, you are looking at the impact of your cost and your volumes on your profit. That's cost of volume profit. So under this, there's contribution, there's break-even analysis, and there's target analysis. Under break-even, there's price and cost changes, margin of safety, break-even graphs, so there's a lot going on within this analysis. So as a management accountant, as I've said, it's all good and well to be able to calculate things, but you should be able to explain them. You should be able to influence the decisions based on the numbers that you're computing. Okay. Yeah, yes, I want to ask, so I think it's topic one, the least squares method. Um, I just want you to explain because now there was an assignment, if I can remember, that we had to answer this question. What is the quickest way? Because now, if you can see, we have to use those two tiles down there to be able to calculate our our answers. So if we get a question you, that we have to use, the least square method, what would be the quickest way to do it? Because I think I struggled answering that um, I think it was part of the assignments that we did now. Yeah, it, you know what? For the least square method, I understand it. It 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 it's quite a lot, eh? Um, oh, okay. I haven't, yeah, I'm just saying the way to answer it. I I haven't come across a situation where 
this the quickest way to answer it because it's a bit detailed when it comes to now looking at the type of cost that you have, the units that you've produced, which one is fixed, which one is variable, and then going down and down cost equation. Um, I, I don't know if anyone in the class who has seen a quickest way to uh, go about the least square method. The simple, for others who don't know, it's the simple regression analysis. I think, Dike Lady, I'll send the link to the WhatsApp group, as I've mentioned later on. If you can, maybe send me a screenshot of the question. And, and, and But honestly speaking, how they do it inside the textbook, so far that's the method that I know, um, where you first have to do the X, Y part, and then thereafter it's the like using the two equations to go about answering the question. I just don't know the quickest way at the moment. Oh, okay. No, thanks, then. Yeah. Sorry about that. But I get your... I wouldn't say it's frustration, <laughs> but I get what you mean in terms of time. Because um, it is a factor. So where was I? CDP. So cost, volume, profit, as I've explained, it investigates the change in profit that results in the following. So your profit might change because of the activity levels, meaning what you produced and what you sold, right? So your profit might change because of the change in activity levels, meaning what you produced and what you sold. We all know this, right? You could be um, easy there making tables, 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 and it all depends on the demand of those tables at the end of the day. So the number that you've produced versus what you sold, it affects the profit that you've made for that month or that year or that quarter or semi half year. Né? Then what you also have to take into account that your profit also determines, I mean, it, 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 it relies heavily on your selling price. So if you change your selling price, it'll, you will have to see the impact on your profit. If you keep it the same, you'll also see the impact on your profit. Then um, the other one is variable costs. This one goes along with your change in activity and then your total fixed cost. So when we talk about profit, you see how many elements go inside the profit that you make at the end of the month or whatever that you're selling, you have to think about your volumes that you sold, that you produced. How much are you selling this thing? How much did you spend to make this product? So variable and total fixed cost. Okay. So as I've mentioned, first part, I'm going slowly so you guys understand, but it's this are some of the that there's certain assumptions that we use for CVP, okay? What are those? Is that selling price in this instance stays the same irrespective of the change in your volumes that you sell. So that's an assumption that we are using. Your selling price stays the same, so it doesn't change. Cool. All the costs are linear, meaning they can be accurately divided into variable and fixed. So you can see your fixed and variable cost. We good. Another assumption that we use when we are doing CVP is that variable costs are constant per unit, whereas your fixed costs are constant in the relevant range. So your fixed cost. It's not a thing of you're changing your supplier, now there's an increase or what, what, no. Whatever that you are used to paying for your variable pair, the unit stays the same. Not to say that your variable total cost stays the same, please. It's different there. Then, uh, ah, sales mix is constant in the multiple. Your levels do not change, meaning the number that you've produced is the number that you've sold. All right, so there's a lot of 
assumptions that we say in that this is when you can use CVP to get a clear picture of your profit. Your selling price needs to be the same. You can be able to distinguish between variable and fixed. Your variable costs are constant per unit, and your fixed cost is also the same within a relevant range. And also, your inventory doesn't change, meaning what you produced and what you sold is the same. And there's a relevant range only. This is crucial that you know that it's between zero and 100, not zero and, and 150. You are introducing another range. So meaning you have to now do another CVP analysis. So what's the message here is to say that there's a certain level of production and sale. This is where your production and your sale is the same, but you're working with a certain capacity and range. Once you move outside this range, you have to do another CVP analysis. Okay, so that's, uh, those are the assumptions that come into play when you're doing a cost volume analysis. Cool. I hope it makes sense to you, but those are the basis of saying, when do I use the CVP analysis? Those are the assumptions that you refer to. Okay. Just an FYI to be able to know when to use CVP. Right now, I'm going to the second pillar of that structure that we had, which is cost volume. Cost volume. Um, what's this thing? Contribution. Sorry, my bad. Contribution. So, contribution. What is the formula? It's contribution. It's sales minus total. You see, they said total, please. Total. I'm going to mention why. But it's your sales minus total variable cost. What do you guys understand by this total? Maybe if I may ask, what what would you put under your total variable cost? Yes, variable selling expenses. Pardon? Your variable selling expenses plus your so, variable manufacturing cost. Yeah, so it's both both indirect, direct variable cost. So. Anything that falls under variable cost. For, so here, what I'm trying to say is that it's not only your direct your manufacturing variable cost being your direct labor, direct material only. No, there's also selling and distribution. So it's all variable production cost plus non non production cost, which are variable. So that's what I'm saying. Both your direct and indirect variable costs, they come here. Are we all on the same page? So always remember that contribution is yes, it's sales minus total variable costs. It's very important that you know. Because where does it catch you when you are doing your direct income statement? Because the way that you present it, it's sales minus variable costs, then you get your contribution. You have to show it on your income statement. So it's not only in CVP, it also catches you on, on another topic. That's why they say that it's total, total variable cost. Cool? So that's your formula one under contribution. Then there's contribution ratio. This is a ratio where we are looking at your sales. Um, this is total sales. So we are trying to see what is your contribution percentage over your sales in relation to your sales? So here is a definition of it. It's, 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 it's presented as a percentage. And um, you are trying to see the percentage of sales that are, are available to cover your fixed cost. So... What am I saying? Let's use the same example of a table. I'm sorry that I'm just going to run with it, Robin, but I did say I'm going to do that. With a table, 
after selling my table and also taking into account the nails, the wood, the labor, the selling and distribution of this table, how much do I make? That's my contribution. How much of it can actually cover my fixed cost? Because I still have to pay the rental space at the mall. I still have to make sure that admin costs, you know, all those fixed costs are covered. So that's your contribution ratio to see the percentage of sales that are available to cover my fixed costs. Are we all understanding? That's what contribution does. So it's a very important um, element that you have to do. Even if you are running your own business, you always have to see that after looking at the income, I mean, my sales that I've made and the variable cost, these two go hand in hand. The variable cost is directly proportional to what we've produced and what, and remember we said that under CVP, my production and my sales are the same. So they are directly proportional to my sales if you look at it. So that means that after I've covered these variable costs, I've absorbed it, can, can this thing actually still cover my fixed cost? Because it wouldn't make sense for you to still continue if it's not, right? Because you'll always be in a lost position. And that's where people end up try to, people try their level best to reduce fixed costs, if you think about it. Um, every single major business, cost is a sensitive um, and crucial element to running their business because these are the fixed costs where you can't run away from them no matter what happens with your contribution. You always have to pay them. So you always have to find a way to cover these fixed costs because fixed costs don't care whether the economy is bad or there's riots or whatever. Fixed cost stays the same. You just have to make sure that you cover them. You know? Um, yeah. Cool. Any questions before I get into break even point? Do you guys understand what contribution is and why we use it? Okay. I'll take silence as good. All right. So, two things to take out of this this is how you calculate your contribution. This is another formula to also know that you can get your ratio. Be able to explain and discuss what this contribution ratio is. It's all fun and well to know how to calculate. Be able to explain what does it mean because it influences the decisions that you make. Oh, so point number two under CVP, break-even point. Okay. So... What is break even point? This is the point where profit is zero. So you're not making a loss, you're not making a profit. Meaning, whatever you sold covers all your costs. So you're not making any profit, you're not making any loss. It's, it's just that point where total contribution, you are able to cover your fixed costs but you're not going over and above, meaning you're not making a profit and you're not going any less. It's just zero. So whatever that you determined here, sales minus whatever, if it's 100 and your fixed cost is 100, you, you were able to get to a point where it's zero. You, you've broken even. That's what break even point is. Okay? So um, when operating performance goes beyond the break even, that's when now you're going over and above, that's when you'll experience profit. Most businesses, you'd find it at the beginning, I'm just talking now just in, in practical. Most businesses, when they start, the first few years, it could be two or three years, others, can, yeah, two or three years, I'm just making an example, on average, they are all striving towards breaking point. They could be making a loss at the beginning as they're going, but once you break even, that's a, that's a huge plus for your business because you will now know what is it, what other range can you put in, what could you do to now go over or under. 
meaning either make a loss or you're making a profit. So even with you, if you have a business or whatever, or people in your family or your friends, that they are all striving towards breaking even. You must always strive to at least get to a point where your sales cover all your costs, both variable and fixed. Then thereafter, you know that you're working towards making a profit. Okay. But here is that the profit can be calculated by means of another linear, same linear equation, where Y, it's your net profit, B, it's your contribution, X is the number of units sold, so you're getting your contribution, minus A, this is your total fixed cost, right? So then you will see, are you making a profit, are you making a loss, or are you breaking even? You guys understand, this is a formula that you will need to know, because at the end, um, you find that they use it for forecasting your profit, but you'll see as we go. Mathematically, the break-even point is expressed as the following. So when you talk about breaking even, that means that your net profit will be zero, right? Because I said it's the point where profit is zero. Then you've got your B, your contribution, your units, and then your total fixed cost, then this is just maths. So just at the end, you are left with number of units that you need to sell where you are breaking even. Because break even points, sometimes they'll tell you express it in units, express it in value. But some you need to know as a business as to what are the units that I need to sell in order to break even. Because as I've mentioned, any business, especially at the beginning, it's fighting to get to a break even point where they are not making any profit or loss, but what's important is that they are covering their costs. So you will be left with a situation where, in order for me to determine this break even point unit, um, my I'll be taking my total fixed cost over my contribution per unit. Um, so there's, it, it brings about the formula, as I've mentioned, that the question might come to say, calculate the number of units that you need to sell in order to break even, or what is the sales value of those units? So break even point, be careful when you're asking your question. Are they asking me in terms of units or are they asking me in terms of volume? I mean, a value. Don't just see break even point and start calculating units. Look at the required so that you answer it properly. So this is the formula for when you're doing in units. I've covered it there. And then when it comes to value, you can take your break even units and just multiply it by the selling price. Or you take your total fixed cost, you divide it by the contribution ratio. And B, that you know different ways, as I've mentioned, each and every single principle has various ways that they can ask you questions. Know those different ways. So from this, we know that break-even point can be calculated in three ways. Meaning, when you see a question, if they give you a contribution ratio, you can calculate break-even value because you have your total fixed cost. Look at what you have, then you will know which tool to use to calculate it. Recap, break even point, the certain assumptions that we are using, and I've mentioned them. There's a relevant range that you're working with. This is where your production in your sales activity stays the same. And uh, contribution, we need to know what sales, like can our sales cover our fixed costs? Then get to the point that if it's a yes or no, if it's a yes, to what point can it cover? If the profit is zero, brings into play, sorry, break even point. And this break even point is the number of units that I need to sell for me to be able to cover all my cost, fixed costs, where loss is not experienced. And break-even point can be calculated in three ways. I mean, it, it, there's two ways, but three. 
Um, is that it's in the number of units that you need to sell or is the value and that value can be done by taking your break even units times your selling price or your using contribution ratio. Oh, it's a mouthful, but please just go over them. As I've said, if you've covered this so far, this is revision. Margin of safety. What do you guys understand as margin of safety? It shows us by how much sales should decrease before we start making a loss. Yes, yes, because it's, 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 yes, it's exactly that. Thank you for your contribution. So mm, this margin of safety can also be in units of value, or you can calculate it in ratio. We are all striving, you see this analysis, we are all striving to make a profit or get to a point where it's zero, where you're not suffering losses. So these formulas are indicators for you to be able to advise or be able to interpret what's going on with your company. So margin of safety in terms of how you calculate it is total sales in units minus your break-even sales. Then you will see that safety region that you can play along with before you make a loss. Also in value, you will use total sales or break-even sales. So there's two ways of calculating this. That in units or value, I still say very important that you are alert of what is required than just jumping the gun and putting in formulas and you're surprised when you get your answer, right? Then the ratio, they say the margin of safety can also be expressed as a percentage of the total sales value or units. That's the ratio. So the ratio is like this. is your total sales units minus your break-even relative to that. So you are just seeing the gap between what sales, what's, what's that safety region before you make a loss. Then it's also in value. So let's go and do question one. Madam, can I ask, sorry, before you carry on? Yeah. In terms of uh, margin for safety and um, break even point, uh, which one kind of comes first? Comes first in terms of? Like, uh, let's say for business, um, which one do you mostly focus on before you get to the other? Do you focus on your margin to safety or do you focus on your break even point? I'd say both, but you have to know your break even first, right? Because margin of safety in the formula, it needs break even sales units of value in order for you to be able to see how safe you are. But you'll have to start with your break even. But you need both, right? right? Yeah, but you start with your break even point first. Break even, okay. Let's do question one. Because question one just answers the basis of what we spoke about. So do question one A and B. Uh, yeah, I think let's do A till E. So I'm going to give you guys some time. It should take you like 10 minutes. Let's do this question. So Boca Limited produces and sells a single product. The following information is obtained for budget for the month ending 30 October. You have your sales units being 20,000 units, and this is the value. Then they give you direct material, direct labor, and the manufacturing overheads being variable and fixed, and the say, selling and administrative cost. Then they split into the variable and fixed. What you are asked to do is contribution per unit the ratio, break-even units, and value, margin of safety, and also interpret your answer. Very important, D. Then E, the number of units that must be sold to earn a profit of 500,000. So please, I'm giving you, let's say 15 minutes. Do A till E. I'm timing you because you have to get into the habit of pressure. Um, so I'm timing you 15 minutes, then thereafter 15 minutes, I'll be selecting anyone in the group, the safe space, to give me the answers, then we go through the solution. Cool, 15 minutes starts now. I managed to finish awesome. A, a and B. 
Okay. And how did you guys find the question? Straightforward, right? Straightforward, yes. Very straightforward. The basis and um, all right, cool. I'm gonna do A, B, C because they are straightforward. But I need you guys to take me through margin of safety and E, the units that needed to be sold in order to make that five hundred thousand profit. Basic, basic question. But I'm just 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 looking if you guys understand the principle. If you almost got the answer, let me know so that you can see what is it that we need to fix. Or if you have any questions, let me know. Cool. Contribution per unit, straightforward. You need to get your selling price, right? So in order for you to get that, they gave you the total selling price. You got the units. Then you get your per unit. Then you need your, for you to do contribution, you need your variable cost. You line them up. Remember, it's total variable cost. So this is where you have your direct material. You have your labor. You have your variable overheads. You have your selling admin. As you guys can see, you remember the assumptions that you are using here is that what you're selling, it's equivalent to what you produced. So this is where the assumptions come into play. Do you guys see? But anyway, you got your variable cost to be 26 rand. So your total contribution for 20,000 units is 480. Your total, because now it's not per unit, but it's total. Then to get the per unit one, you it's 24 rand. So I hope we are on the same page. Okay. Shout if you have any questions, because I'm just going to run through. We are almost out of time. Contribution ratio, it's your contribution per unit over the selling price, 25 rand over the 50. Or you use the value, which is contribution value over your sales value. Then it's 48%. Okay. 48% of your sales can cover your fixed cost. Remember the interpretation thereof. Break even point, firstly calculate the fixed cost. So you take all your fixed costs that you have, it's total fixed cost. Um, so it's both manufacturing and non-manufacturing. So it's 110. And then the um, break even, it's your fixed cost over your contribution per unit, that 110 over the 24. So you need to round it up because with break even, it doesn't make sense for you that you have to do 4,083.3 tables. Doesn't make sense, right? So you have to round it up. So you are making 4,584 4, units. That's what you need to sell for your profit to be zero. Then break even value, you take the fixed cost over the contribution ratio that you calculated here. The 48%, and this is your break even value. Okay. Um, okay, cool. So, margin of safety, what did you guys do? And it's the margin of safety ratio. It's sales unit minus the break even unit divided by the sales unit times 100%, then we get 77.08%. 0. 0.7. 77.08%. Okay, so 77%, right? Okay. So how you got it? You said sales minus mm -hmm. minus break-even break sales. No, break-even. Then, mm -hmm. then divide the sales unit. Mm -hmm. Then times 100. Yes. So what does this mean? Uh, I think it means that the business is safe because it has a ratio of 77%. Uh, please come again, Nontlantla. What does it mean? Anyone can help. It doesn't have to be Nontlantla. Yes? I think, um, uh, I think uh, it will take the business. Like I think it's good because 
it will help to take about 77% for the business to start showing a loss. Yes, so... I think yes, so it's it means the business is doing well. Oh, yes. Know. So sales can decline by 77% before you start showing your, your loss. So as you've said, it's a good indication. Like if it's 77%, that means that something major needs to happen for you to start experiencing losses, right? Because margin of safety, the more it's higher, the better. You're in the safe zone. So it means that you're doing good. Because it will take 77% for your sales to decline uh, for you to start showing a loss. Are we all on the same page? What that 77% means or what margin of safety means? It means that it's the percentage that your sales need to decline for you to start showing a loss. So if it's higher, you're in, you're, you're, you're good. Because it, it will take a lot for your sales, uh, I mean, for you to start showing a loss. Does it make sense? Okay, I hope it is. But what I'm trying to show you here is that you need to be able to interpret what you just calculated. All right, so E, because I'm just looking at the time. Uh, e, what, what, are the, what are the units that you need to sell in order to make that 500 thousand net profit anyone any takers how did you guys approach it i need you to be able to articulate what you are doing because that means that you understand uh, the principles so the number of units that i need to sell in order to earn a profit of five hundred thousand. how did you guys approach or attempt this question is there anyone who attempted this question Tawanda. Um, Any, yes. Yeah, I used the fixed cost, add that to the uh, target profit and divide that sum by the contribution per unit of 24. Okay, please repeat that again. Okay, so I used the, the equation of fixed cost plus uh, target profit in the numerator. That okay. sum divided by the contribution per unit, which was worked out as 24. And okay. I bought uh, 25,417 units. Perfect. So what you did for the units sold, you took your fixed cost and what we are targeting, and yes. then you divided yes. it by the contribution per unit, and yes. that's how they got the 25,000 units that you need to uh, sell in order to get this 500, sorry, this 500,000. Okay, correct. Um, any questions related to this? Okay. Um, all right, so I did say that I'm going to uh, have five minutes with you. I did share the link inside the chat box for the WhatsApp. This is your moment to just let me know where are you in terms of your learning units so that I can get a picture of how fast we need to cover some of the topics and when are you writing exams or when is your next assignment? So I'm opening the floor to you just so that I can take notes um, of how to approach the classes. From your side, what's going to be very, very, very important is that you will need to work, okay? Um, this coming month, dedicated to, I know you have other subjects, but just make sure that at least you practice questions. If you are stuck on a question and you don't understand it, post it in the WhatsApp group before our class so that we can look and see how we can help each other. Is that fine? I'm going to awesome. need you guys to not rely on the classes themselves to gain knowledge. Let it be that the classes are used to clarify where you are stuck. So that means that you need to cover through the theory. Let's make sure that we use this coming month fruitfully from both ends. Okay. Um, that's it for today, guys. Thanks so awesome. much for your participation. Um, Thank you.
Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.